Fireside Chat, Episode 7. To blow it up or not to blow it up? That is the question. Recorded March 5th, 2013. Are you ready? See you around. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. Featuring Dan, Matt, and Lucas. That intro gets me going every week. Matt, Lucas, welcome back for another episode. How are you guys doing? Very good. I'm alright. I think we might have one of the most interesting episodes we've had yet, because this has been an interesting week for the Flames. Um, a lot of talk around the league, and why don't we just get started with talking about the Ryan O'Reilly offer sheet. I'm sure by now everybody knows what the deal was, so we probably don't have to get into the background of it, but uh, who wants to start with their thoughts on O'Reilly? Well, uh, I guess let's first start by saying that uh, when it happened... Uh, I loved it. Like it was, it addressed a need, and you can get all caught up you want. Or you can get caught up as much as you want in signing a player who's got 55 points, or who's only ever scored 55 points in the NHL in a season. But when you do that as at 22 years old, and you are a center, you're getting better. You're winning faceoffs at 52 percent. Uh, you haven't peaked. You are. You're only getting better. And I love the move as it was made at that moment it, from that aspect of it. Well, for me, I was kind of on the fence because, like, I, I do like O'Reilly and, you know, he is a good player. I, I was just a little confused why the Flames might lose a potential top 10 pick for it. But uh, it w- one of the things that I thought up after. Uh, writing an article on the website was that perhaps uh, the Flames were trying to do something similar to what they did when they traded Tangay to Montreal and acquired Camilleri from LA where they ended up going from like I think 13th overall to 18th overall because they both traded and acquired a first round pick in each of those trades so perhaps what they were doing was getting O'Reilly giving up their 10-12 overall pick and then subsequently trading off one of the established vets for a first-rounder plus. So, you know, trading down yeah, while really getting an elite player. I was especially concerned with, uh, with the loss of the first just because I figure Ryan O'Reilly at this point in his career is already likely better than or, or, sorry, he's for sure better than the potential of some 8 to 12th overall pick. Now, having said that, he is not necessarily, I don't think he's worth a top three pick by any stretch. But, I mean, I, I, I don't think that if you make that move, I don't think you're a top you're, I don't think you pick Yeah, I totally three. agree with what Lucas Barring, said. I mean, uh, you know, I'm still of the mind that this team frankly, needs to get better and not the, gun the, for that top five pick. And when I saw this to, deal come through, I was a bit worried at first about giving up the first uh, round pick. That but when you look around the league and what the cost of a first round, a first line center is, I thought it was a fair cost. I mean, if we were to go out and try to acquire him through trade or acquire somebody similar through trade, we'd pay a lot more for potentially an older guy. Ryan O'Reilly was 22. He's a guy who could lead this team in the future, and he's a guy who I don't think has peaked yet. So I thought it was a heck of a deal. Um, and I, I was as soon as I saw the Feaster made that move, I thought, yeah, Feaster's trying to better this club, which is a GM he has to do. Yeah, and I mean, no, no one, even the rebuild people, I don't think are saying, you know, never try to improve it. Like, the if you don't have the talent and you fall flo- short, then that's reality. That's life. That happens. Uh, it's people get bothered by intentionally tanking and, you know, looking like you're not trying. 
but you know that that's that's not what's going on here. I do also think that uh, you know you you are you were acquiring potentially like a future captain. Like he was bummed he didn't get the captaincy from Landeskog. Uh, and that right there solves you. Like it gives you a franchise player right away to build around. And it's a, it fills an organizational hole that's existed since 1995. Or at least since Savard left. Yeah. Um, though one thing that I will, was a little bit on the fence with as well is that there are a few decent centers available in free agency so you know like there's a, a good chance that if you threw the money at them that you could get a similar production value without surrendering a pick although it would be a guy that's 27 or 28 versus 22 Unfor- unfortunately but, like the reality of the situation is yeah. teams do not let true number one centers hit free agency like it just it rarely if ever happens i mean if it, if true number one centers only cost uh lombardi prust and a first then everyone would have one uh and frankly and a first and a third for a 22 year old ryan o'reilly is far below market value and anyone that we would be able to pick up in free agency whether it were ribero or I don't know, maybe like I, I know Stephen Weiss is. We talked about him last week. He's hurt for the rest of the year now. I don't know if he's a free agent at the end of this year, but it's all that like you know, oh Craig Conroy type ceiling players, like. <laughs> well, both Ryan Getzlaff and Blatteri Filpula are both free agents as well, that are all in the fifty to. I'd be worried giving up that first range, if we were going so. for, say, a 27 or 28 year old. But to me, when you're acquiring a 22 year old center, I mean, you know, that's a that's a a guy who we would draft by the time he's matured. We're just you know running that cycle early, I guess, and getting the matured young player who's hopefully going to be with this team for a while. So I was okay giving up the draft pick for that. Yeah, um, and, and honestly, as much as it would. It's a pipe dream or, or a fantasy even to to have Getzlaff hit free agency, much less come here. I, I don't think there's any way that Anaheim lets him walk. I mean, they'll they'll ditch Perry and give Getzlaff what he wants, but you cannot, like I, like I just said, you don't let franchise number one centers just hit free agency and leave. It's, it's suicide. Um, also, the reason, like... This is a very good Definitely center draft. Not. I've looked at uh, um, Button's uh, list on tsn.ca, and he's got 13 centers with first-round grades. Uh, and a couple of them are center-winger combos. But th- there's no excuse not to add one based on... Yeah, I, I think you'll be able to add a centerman for sure. It might not be one of the top two or three centermen. Um, but yeah, I definitely think you know somewhere in the top 30... You you'll find a centerman who this team could take. Well, we're talking about O'Reilly. Um, what do you guys think of the of the actual numbers on the contract? I mean, we know that the Flames made it high. They said that they would be almost sure that they were gonna uh, not have Colorado match the offer sheet. But do you guys think it was a fair price? It was fine. Like it, you know, you've got a what you're not giving up in assets, so just a first and a third. You are giving up, you know, you've got to do something that makes it somewhat prohibitive for the Avalanche to match or have a potential to match. And then, you know, oh, you have a $5 million cap. I don't really care about the money. Uh, it's not my money. And a $5 million cap it for a first line well, that's center. It. For a first line reasonable. center, I thought it was perfectly reasonable. Yeah, everyone got hung up for the over the actual cash, but the cash has no impact on how the franchise actually operates. And if it's not our money, why do you care? Well, like if the compensation hadn't been higher, if the Flames would have offered even more money, yeah, I, I think the Flames might have offered like uh, over $6 million, That price is too to much for O'Reilly. Four first-round picks, that's just ludicrous for and a player like O'Reilly. And of course, we'll of the whole next part of the story, but do we want to spoil that? Go now? ahead. We didn't. Well, okay. So obviously, we didn't get him, uh, and it's a good thing we didn't because if we did, 
uh, he would have had to go immediately on re-entry waivers, I believe, and then Columbus would have claimed him, and we would have given up a first-round pick and a third-round pick so that Columbus could have a franchise player. And, and, and two and a half million dollars, just to add the extra kick in the butt there. <laughs> It's not my money. If, they, if that happened, they deserve There's been some the debate, money. though, from what I've read about how that rule was interpreted with the re-entry waivers. So I haven't read the actual uh, CBA to know, but I know the Flames posted something on their website the next day talking about how they interpreted that, and the agent for O'Reilly agreed. So I think they may have had a case to take that up with the league. Yeah, but with the Bill Daly, he was saying that uh, the flames were wrong at you know when the deputy commissioner of the league says that your interpretation was not correct that kind of you know I have to think that the dicey. flames would have talked to somebody at the league before they would have done this though because yeah if you lose them on waivers that's gonna make it look like even more of a joke well that's a franchise destroying move right there yeah uh, like that's a fire everybody move. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Like the, uh, you know, everyone except Malarchuk, just get him gone at that point. Like that. That is. Like, w- what is your job if not to know that? Really, like, I mean, I I know that you're trying to be ballsy and you know make a big splash, but pick up a phone. And I don't really care that you know your interpretation was different. If the, the mere fact that you had a different interpretation and didn't question it, it's it's like you know, it's it's like committing a crime, but thinking you'll you're out, your ace in the hole is you're pretty sure you can beat it in court. Yeah, and anytime you encounter legalese, like it's all a matter of interpretation, and you know, like you need clarification. That's why they have lawyers. So you know, like. Just seemed a little inept, but it it makes the organization look Mickey Mouse, and I I don't care that Feaster came out like we had a position and we were ready to take it to the the league office. Who cares? It doesn't matter. And and you know what? The, the league does share a little bit of blame in in that when this was made, I don't know that you know it. If there was any possibility, because this is a completely new CBA, never been, never before seen situation, um, maybe the league would have been like, "Hey, you guys know that if this happens, um, you're going to lose him, right?" Uh, yeah, I agree with or, you. The league should have almost so- stepped in and said, "Guys, are you sure you want to do this? Here's how we're interpreting this rule, just so you know." Yeah, like even when you download a torrent, it asks you if you're sure. Um, one, so we've seen now with the O'Reilly move, I think that Feaster is serious about trying to upgrade the center position. And I think that's one thing that became evident from this. Since we lost the O'Reilly sweepstakes, any idea what he's going to do next? Any thoughts on what you'd perhaps like to see Feaster do next? Honestly, I don't see the Flames being able to address the center position because of the fact that the prices will be too high right now. And... Like most of the other teams, they're kind of the ones that you would be trading with. They don't have the type of talent available, and the cost would be prohibitive. And like that's why, like Feaster was saying uh, that, like they tried to acquire O'Reilly through trade, and like the cost was just too much. So, you know, it's. Just the bat. The worst time to try and address something like this is right in the middle of the season when you're fighting for a playoff spot with like five other teams. You know what I want the next move to be? Nothing. I want Jay Feaster to shut up and sit in his office and sit on his hands and responsibly carry out his business at the trade deadline. I am tired of the false bravado and the speeches and the intellectual honesty, and we have a chance to make our own history, and we're, we're buyers, and just do the responsible thing. Don't, it's not about making a show or making a splash or whatever. Just do what makes sense to everyone in the hockey world except you guys. And when everyone else thinks you should do something and you don't, 
odds are it's not everybody else that's playing. Yeah, it's not like you just add O'Reilly and magically the Flames are going to be a Stanley Cup team. Like, even if they had gotten O'Reilly, they would still be a 10th to 12th place team. But he's the kind of guy that you look for in the future. I mean, he's 22. Whether or not this year, he'll help next year, year after. Oh, I'm not, I know. I'm not saying like that he wouldn't be useful. There's down no the road, one we could acquire at this point that would magically make us a Stanley Cup team. Yeah, but the thing is that the Flames are un- operating under the premise that they actually are a Stanley Cup caliber team. When you know they are just a collection of guys that can score goals and not keep any of them out. <laughs> Are they are they really operating under that? Because it, a lot of the decisions with regard to specifically Sven, the the way his ice time uh, has been uh, limited, and maybe that's not as they're trying to shelter him, not asking to do too much. But against Vancouver the other day, he made no fewer than three outstanding defensive plays, and in the last five minutes of the game, Blake Como who's been a disaster, or sorry, 17, who's been a disaster in almost every situation he's been put in, was taking his shifts. And I, I, I wonder if it's not an attempt from Hartley and Feaster to show that the vets can't get it done or something, but it's probably not. That's giving them too much credit. But I, I don't understand how you can be in a win-now mode when all you've done is lose for four years. I know. Like, it, it, the exact opposite of intellectual honesty, because anybody that has ever watched hockey knows that this team is not good. And, you know, like, a lot of the decisions that they make, like, even in regards to ice time, like, you look at how Curtis Glencross and uh, Alex Tanga and 17 have played, like, they should not be getting first and second line ice time. They should be getting, like, 10 minutes a night and throw Tanga and Glencross on the power play, maybe, you know, like, until they figure out what they're doing wrong. Okay, well, I was just going to say, I am, for right now, finished with seeing Curtis Glenn Cross on the power play. Like, it's not... Every, it seems like so many players in on our first-line power play just have the puck die on their sticks, and then it gets turned over and fired down the ice. And, again, like you brought it up last week, Curtis Glenn Cross, when he plays within himself, very effective player, could poss- has, has the skill and sense to score 30 goals when he's stick-handling and trying to be an actual top-line player, other than, you know, a, a, a faster Ryan Smith, uh, it, it's a nightmare. And, and get off the first-line power play. Put Berchi on if you're going to have someone hold the puck and try and do something. Oh, no, like, I would be putting them on, like, as, like, the last 30 seconds of the power play type of thing. Not on the first unit. I'd have either Hoodler or Berchi or Backlund or, you know other players cycle them in that are actually performing like I'd even have Stajan out there because he's been doing rather well too so it's just confusing some of their I don't get the sense they think they're Stanley Cup contenders but I do get the sense they think they can make it to the top 8 and based on what we've seen lately and where they're standing I don't think they're entirely wrong with that and I'm still not sure that's not the right decision for this year. I mean, as much as we'd like to get a center and, you know, move up, look at what Edmonton's done, where they've been in that position for the last three years and haven't got anything done. And I've always been in that position that if you have the chance to make it to the playoffs, you want to do that. And I, I'm looking at this team. We're sitting at 20 points. We need 24 to get to eighth. I still think it's feasible, and I think it's, it might be the right move this year and got it in the off season. Well, the, I, I just want to get a quick point in there. Um, with Mathematically, for the remaining games in the season, the Flames have to perform as if uh, they're one of the top three teams in the league the rest of the way in order to hit 54 uh, points, which is like the threshold for eight, theoretically. And I don't see them being as good as Chicago, Anaheim, or Vancouver the rest of the way. 
Yeah, you're right. right. No. Yeah, I like didn't that's... realize that was the math. They they have a sixteen percent chance of making the playoffs right now. That that was as as of like I think four days ago or six days ago. So that number's probably changed, but it's not gone up considerably. And like look at it this way. If you went to a doctor and the doctor said you have a twenty percent chance that this cancer is gonna kill you, would you be assuming you were going to live? Or would you be would you be thinking this probably I should probably get my affairs in order. I should twenty percent is going to kill me. I'd assume I'm probably going to live. No, no, no. A twenty percent chance oh. of survival. Um, Sorry, I don't know. It depends if. Yeah, that's and where we are. You and do, we, and you, at the same time, I'm the not best, big but... into what a lot of people suggest of let's just tank it. I feel let's fight until the end and see where we make it. Because I, I mean, I don't want this team to. Uh, selfishly, I'd like them to get a top pick, but I don't want to see this team drafting in the top five because that means something went horribly wrong. Something's been horribly wrong. But we've managed to stay out of that now. position. Well, I don't think that you trade everybody off, like, in the next two weeks. Like, if the flame, you have to see, because there's so many games back-to-back. Like, all it takes is the flames to win six or seven games in a row, and they'll be in the playoff spot. It's just that you don't know until you get there. So, like, if the flames are going to trade off guys like a Gimla or Bomeister or whomever you'll likely see that towards the end of March or early in April, right before the deadline. Yeah, I mean, all it takes is for them to do something that they've given no uh, no impression that they're remotely capable of all year. Like a six or seven game win streak. Like, look at this team. What's our what's our longest win streak of the year? Three? Uh, if maybe. that, I think maybe two. I think they won back to back games against the uh, Red Wings in the Wild or something like that in early February, and that's it. Like, at, yeah, I just think you point, can't like, you can't just have a fire sale and I sell am, every every asset we've got this year because that's not going to help us going forward. Hold on. Oh no, you Why you identify it? a few players that you keep around, like. But there are certain guys that, you know, you can get away with. Yeah, like, like to me, if you can get a good price from the deadline, like maybe. But, I mean, the draft is, and this is more of a Sutter thing, but the draft is notoriously where we made our big move. And to me, if they're not, if their contract doesn't expire in on July 5th, or I guess July 4th this year, um, why are we in a rush to move them if it may not help us? Be- because. At the trade deadline, it's when everyone gets irrational and freaks out and thinks they've got a shot and they're willing to overpay. At the draft, everyone's reasonable and they've had time to reflect. They've been going over their organizational yeah, and plan for two and a half months. There's no you. No, you you're right. I mean, if we can get a good draft, deal at the deadline, at the but deadline. I just don't want to move guys for the sake of moving them. Well, the thing is, is that the, the teams that are in like the bottom ten. The only good offensive forwards are Mike Ribeiro, Vaclav Prospol, and Milan Hayduk. Like, that's it. They, there's nobody else. And amongst defensemen, it's only Smead and Strike. Like, there's not really a lot of anything that one would trade for. It's And, like, the rest of the teams are relatively close or fighting for a playoff spot. So, like, the Flames have... A good position where they have a bunch of players that are statistically performing like first line players, but you know the team isn't performing like they have that many offensive weapons. So you know it. It seems like the Flames might end up being like a one stop shop for playoff teams looking to acquire people because we do have quite a few competent. Yeah, well, pieces. and again, if if we're gonna get a good price at the deadline. Then let's sell, but let's not just sell for the point of let's blow this thing up and try it again next year. Well, like if someone offers you a seventh round pick for Lee Stempniak, yeah, no. you don't trade him because like that's just stupid. But you know, if someone offers you a second and a fourth, yeah, I just don't feel like this team is as broken as a lot of uh, media has made it seem like, and we've got some pieces that could still be serviceable over the next couple of years. Maybe not in the same role they're in but it could still be serviceable pieces. Okay. 
who who wouldn't you trade? And, and for, first of all, though, why why would we not blow it up this year? Like it's been three years of the same stuff, and not only have we not sold a single asset. Like you think last year we couldn't have gotten a third round pick for Tim Jackman? No, we resigned him for two more years, and Tim Jackman is a regular healthy scratch. That's not good asset management. Uh, Jerome McGinley, if he does not sign an extension before the trade deadline, if this team is not in a playoff position or in or you know playing you know the best hockey of the year at the trade deadline, he's not re-signing here. Like why would he? The, to, to just go through the same song and dance circus every year until he retires, like if he, if if and when he leaves, wherever he goes next, he is not going to be some lightning rod for controversy that he always has to deal with. And as much as I I don't like it when players like Shane Doan, uh, you know, talk about how you can walk around in anonymity in a place like Phoenix, make your millions when your organization is hemorrhaging cash, but you're fine, so of course you're more than willing to stick it out. A guy like Aginla, who's been at the center of a fishbowl his entire career, you know, he might des- he deserves, I think, a chance to go off and have a little bit of a quieter wind down to his career. And you're right. If he's not signed, um, I think we have to deal him at the deadline. As much as as a fan, that hurts me to say because I've been a fan of Jerome since he got here. It's the only logical choice. No, because like, if you let him yeah. walk for nothing, that's a disaster. And, and what we're going to trade? We're going to trade his rights at the well, draft. Well, this year you can't. You can't even trade bird. the rights, guy. They can. Is it this year, or next year, when teams can talk to players without having to trade for their rights? Yeah. It's so yeah, year. if he's not signed by the de- by the deadline, we have to make some tough moves there. Well, well, one thing I found interesting was apparently the Flame Scouts are in Boston tonight viewing the Bruins game. Which I thought the Bruins might be like one of the top. We two talked about that last week. That would be interested in Aginla. Well, it's just yeah, but we talked about where he might land, and we all said the yeah last week the Bruins might be a good spot for him. Yeah, but their scouts are there, so maybe that might be why be. they're there. Who knows? But for sure. But if you're trading Aginla, like. Any roster player I, that's coming back, unless, especially from the Bruins, unless you manage to get Krejci out of there, which I don't imagine you could, um, that's not the move a Stanley Cup contending team makes, trading a center like David Krejci. Um, the, the, the person you're... You, you need to be scouting their their prospects and their farm system, and unless they're giving you Doug Hamilton, which I also don't think is happen, happening... Well, um... I don't know. Are we scouting salary dumps? Well, the thing is, is that, like, when we traded Neuendijk to the Stars for Genla, like, we also got Corey Millen, who was, uh, was a decent third, fourth line guy. So maybe, like, you're looking at something, like, where you're getting a lower-end guy just, you know, as a roster player, not, you know, somebody noteworthy mm-hmm. while getting prospects and all that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, does, does anyone think there's any chance that Aginla is extended before the deadline? Zero. To me, every yeah, week um, I wonder why he hasn't right. re-signed yet, and it's like as we as we keep going on in this season, and Jerome is yet to sign. You you keep wondering why, like why if he wanted to sign here, why isn't why hasn't he got the deal done yet? Honestly, the O'Reilly thing might have actually sealed his fate because if you're a Ginla, you're looking at a GM who every movie's tried, every big movie's tried to make hasn't either hasn't happened or has been an embarrassment. Uh, you want you if even as much as you want to put uh, to win a championship in Calgary, you stop. Iginla has to be wondering if the guy in charge is even capable of You know, it's of interesting that. you mention that, because if you think about it, if O'Reilly came in and he was kind of the new future captain in the face of the franchise, Jerome would almost end where he started. I mean, we traded one of the biggest names of the franchise at the time, Joe Neuendijk, for a young kid who is seen as the new face of the franchise. And if O'Reilly comes in that same position, and Jerome's the veteran, maybe not shipped out in the same deal, but shipped out the same year. It's almost going full circle. Yeah, possible. Yeah, I mean, in, 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 a, in a way, I mean, if we were able to say, again, flip him to, 
flip him to Pittsburgh. Well, for I think, Derek Poliak yeah, and I think. I think There's if we did have O'Reilly, it makes player. that pressure less because, like, okay, now we have our new young face, so we have somebody to promote while we're trading Aginla. So it's not we've traded Aginla, the sky's falling. It's we trade Aginla, but look at this great guy we have to take his place. Yeah, but you know what? Just because you don't have the replacement waiting in the wings, a la you know Aaron Rodgers and Brett Favre, that doesn't mean you. You know, you well, I'm not saying they should hold on to him, but because, this team loves I mean, their PR moves, and that's a great PR move. No, no, I, I, uh, I'm. You know what's great PR? Winning. Yeah, or doing things that rounds. make sense. Yeah, not doing things that every even even the people on Sportsnet who don't seem to know a whole lot when they're questioning you. Um, like they hired Doug McLean, so you know, like. <laughs> Oh, that, that, oh, that's the other thing. Like, one of the parts of, of growing up is realizing just how many people are horrible at their jobs. And, of course, usually th- that, that usually just extends to the service industry. Like, when you're a kid, you think that the person behind the counter at the A&W might as well be Einstein because they're just, they're grown up, they're working somewhere. But I didn't realize that it's everybody. The GMs of professional hockey franchises just... Don't ask questions. They do stupid things, and this is why. Uh, this is why the human race is where it is. Everyone's horrible at their jobs. Us accepted, you know. We're doing a good job. I'm fair. I'm, I'm fair to. We haven't like got that. our performance reviews from the boss yet. We assume we're doing okay. People keep listening, so. And uh, to go back to your earlier point, uh, Luke, when yeah said, like, who wouldn't you trade? Of the forwards, I'd probably keep Glenn Cross, Tange, and Hoodler, just because, well, with Tange and Glenn Cross, they have no movement clauses and long contracts. And the defensemen, basically, Weidman, and, like, the whole, all the kids, basically, like, Everybody else, if the deal's right. Yeah, since you since you later. asked that question, I've been looking at the roster too, and you know I'd probably keep Berchi because I don't think we've seen what we've gotten him yet. Um, I'd keep Hoodler. I think Please. the price is right, and I don't know. Those are the only two. And Glenn Cross are the three I'd keep for forwards. You have to keep Weidman. He's really impressed this year. He's under thirty, and yeah, the kids Brody's got to stay and. I, I don't know. I think outside of uh, Weidman and Brody, I'd be and Geo, I'd be open to moving almost anybody. I'd even move Geo. Like literally, like if you're gonna get something, like if someone's gonna give you a first plus for Jordan. Giordano, see you later. We got to be careful. Peter Marr will get mad at us. I think yeah. I think again, Giordano is the guy that like. You may not start out negotiating with that in mind, but if you're Feaster, uh, just you know, sort of throw out Giordano's name and see what, uh, and just see what happens. And I think his he's still very well respected around the league, and I know he's got a no move clause as well. But like, it's one of those things where do you like? It's all well and good to say you want to stay here, but a contending team comes knocking. You haven't made the playoffs in three years. That no move clause is starting to like the no move clause to me is something you have so you don't get traded to Florida on a whim. Not, yeah, yeah. It, it's it's not so. Oh no, I'm not going to. I'm not going to Pittsburgh. I'm not going to Boston. Does he have? Uh, does Jordan have a regular right no move here. clause or one of these crazy modified no move clauses? Yeah, well, you see, Does like, with the know? $4 million contract, like, that's actually... Oh, a here we go. Just on, I'm on cap He has yeah, a regular no-movement clause so, through 2013-2014, like and then like no trade clause for 2014-2015. Like so, they, I guess, uh, I don't know, he's making $4 million, he was worried he was about saying, being waived or something? Uh, how much the Flames could get for Bo Meester because of how good he's playing. So, you know... Like, Realistically, like, defensemen are in demand, like, especially quality guys like those two. Because, like, uh, on the list for, like, the teams that are not doing so well, like, there's only a couple of 
mediocre guys that aren't on either Bo Meester or Giordano's level, and, you know, more like three, four guys, and that's it. So, you know, like, they could theoretically mop up if they actually decide to sell. And, well, there's not really any trade market for goalies, so... Does Kipper's injury hurt his value? Yet. Who knows what happens at the deadline? Uh, honestly, I would think that uh, mm -hmm. Carolina would at least come kick some tires, see if see what they could find. Ward's going to be out six to eight weeks. They spent a lot of money. In well, the actually, the, uh, the Lightning are actually in like 14th right now, so Lindback I don't see them in a real rush like. to go and get somebody. I don't think, uh, although, God, that would be rough, seeing Kiprasov win a cup as a member of the Lightning. <laughs> um, Do you want us to remind you every week? I forget week? that I hate the Lightning from time to time. Um The twelfth, yeah. Oh my what about um? This and I know this. I know this is crazy because it's a crazy contract. But what if Philadelphia somehow managed to move Breeze Galov? Well, if, they, how would you say like Kipper if the Flyers say traded Breeze Galov to us and they ate like two and a half million well, dollars every it. year? Could you buy him that, out? Could you put him on waivers? Something to ponder, but yeah, I don't see that going anywhere. Well, you could buy him out. No one would take him on waivers. And there's not even that, you know, re-entry, take half of his money sort of thing. Um, yeah, I think it's like 800000 or something well, there, like that. Yeah, and yeah. there's those free buyouts at the end of the year again, and I wouldn't be surprised to see them perhaps put Breeze Gallov on waivers, send him to the farm to get him off the books, and then buy him out in the off season. He's not off the books, though. You can't really. You can only bury oh, a it? certain amount of wow. cap. You can bury like. Oh, the right. Max. I forgot they changed that rule. Yeah. So it's not. There's no point in them even doing that. Um, I was just thinking, as we said, you know, oh, we, we could. Tr everyone should be, you know, free to go or, or available for the right price. But I, I wondered about maybe the organization not wanting to lose any of their. Uh, their star power by trading all these people. But then I realized, how much star power do you really think you have as, you know, a 13th place team in the West whose claim to fame is that we're better than the Oilers and the Blue Jackets, the two worst-run organizations in the league? Like, you don't have star power at that point. You've got some players who you put on poster Well, I mean, that was the Leaf strategy for years, is who cares stuff. who's on the ice? But we're making money with, with this team, right? So... I mean, there's got to be some star power for people to be shelling out to come see the games, or at least perceive star power in the market. So manufacture some. Like, turn, like if you want to turn Dennis Weidman into a star somehow through some commercials or something, or, or you know, you'd have to actually play him, but hype up Sven Berchi. Lucas, we were planning well, to turn fine, you into a star ahead, through but, commercials, I mean, but we ran out of money. Sorry. The, <laughs> We have no money to buy radio or TV commercials. I'd love to be a star. I'll do... But at least I'll, you're Ann Lucas. That makes you special right there. Well, I mean, you know. All right, okay. It does. Okay, watch this. Is your breath uh, tired of bad breath and chronic halitosis? Choose the refreshing taste of Tic Tac, and you'll be sure to be covered from all... I don't know. Screw it. Oh, this is... Not, I, it, it's Tic Tac didn't pay for that. Don't finish it. Read for a product that's not. Uh, yeah. All right. Never mind. Yeah. Enter in the promo code. You know we're gonna have one guy who goes to the Seven Eleven and says Fireside Chat when he tries to buy his Tic Tacs this week. No, it's it's only online. You got it. There's a little radio microphone on the top right hand corner of the web page. Click in Fireside Chat, and if it doesn't work, you shout at the at you phone Tic Tac customer support. You shout at them, and then when Tic Tac phones Dan and is like, what, "What are you doing? Stop using our name," then Dan can be like, 
Hey, man. And that's when they'll realize we're a podcast about a 13th place team that's only better than the Oilers and the Blue Jackets. I know, but we're in a huge Anybody market. have any more griping to do about uh, this roster or anything that they want to see changed? I think I've got it all out of my system. Goal song. I would really like it if they started playing jump Duck sauce has to go. I've thought that since it came in. Duck sauce. There you go. For trading all our players, we might as well trade the music director, too. Oh, um, a Ginla, Poker Face, and a fifth for Pouliot. I don't know that's going to work, but... Make it happen. We don't own the song. We can't trade a song. Well, it doesn't matter. It's a publicity stunt. Like that chick who tried out at the NFL if Combine as a kicker, and she, she it, kicked the if 20 If we're yards. the team that's resorting to that kind of publicity stunt, I don't know that we are any more better than the Oilers or the Blue Jackets. We're not! That's the thing. The, the worst, like... The, the worst type of person is someone who doesn't recognize what they are. Like a fat guy who doesn't know he's fat. On a on a bit of a lighter note, on. I wanted to uh, see what you guys thought about Kipper. Looks like he's healthy. Uh, Lucas, you said some of practice today, and he's looking good. When do you think he starts? Yeah, he looks fine. I'd like selfishly, I want him to start tomorrow. Tomorrow uh, being the Sharks game. Whenever he's like he's he's close, so that's that's good. Yes, Sharks game. Sorry, I I, I forgot this isn't live. Um, yeah, I, I don't uh, I don't see why he's not back by the weekend. Like, according to what I saw with the interview with the coach, he only won two goalies mm-hmm. on the ice. So Taylor well, worked actually, out early, and then he was with the conditioning coach like the first period, um, on and the and bike and stuff while the team the was on the ice. In that Phoenix game, he actually looked composed the entire yeah, time. Yeah, it was. By the way, good and for him. I, I, I love that after the game, Taylor said he thought his other game was better when he got beat 4 nothing. That he would have done a little bit better. A win's a win, but, you know, it, it, yeah, it, it, you know, it was a good showing, but, result-wise, but, you know. And he gave up two goals. The flan... I'm just looking on the calendar. According to the Flames calendar, they play the uh, Kings twice in three days in the Kings' barn. They play them Saturday and then Monday. So if you start Kipper, do you start him, say, Friday? That way Joey McDonald gets the Kings one night and you switch it up and put Kipper in the other night against them? McDonald, even though I think Taylor's the better goalie. Uh, I think you start him the well, whoever you, you start over, you think gives you the best chance to win. And if Kipper's healthy, that's him in the first game. And then you, I don't know, you at least have the when Kipper's back. Who do you guys think backs him up? Stealing something, but I, you know, yeah, I, I, yeah. Well, I mean, we said a couple weeks ago that you guys thought that uh, Taylor was definitely going to get that job, and I think McDonald is the guy that's going to get the job. No question. No, I, I never said that I thought t- Taylor was going to get that job. I'd said Taylor is the highest ceiling out of that group, that gaggle of McDonald, Irving, and McDonald, er, and uh, Taylor. Um, you know, he, he shouldn't be the backup because Joey McDonald is he is exactly what the team needs. He's a veteran who can play every couple of games, like every fourth or fifth game, and come off the bench and whatever, be responsible. But Danny Taylor is yeah. far away. And I mean, you know, maybe they'll player. re-sign Taylor in the summer because they see that, because uh, he's only on a, a deal to the end of the year. But yeah, I think that strategically, Joey McDonald is a better pick. And the news today out of Calgary was Joey McDonald's got his new mask. Is anyone excited for his new mask? I'm actually not going to be excited for a Flames goalie mask until I see Kiprasov with a different, uh, a different yeah, thing other than the Flaming skulls. Even though that's, seems that's you know that's kind him. of bad. That's like his Eddie the Eagle yeah. or Curtis Joseph or 
bartender brother. So they're not. He's not going to change. Joey Max point. mask I'd is pretty bad. Too. Too. He's got Everyone the truck from the movie just, Cars on the side, and then the tail of the flaming sea, and that's about it. Yeah. We were talking before the show about the best Flames goalie yeah. masks. Who do you guys think have the best Flames goalie masks? I'm with you on that one. I Not only the mask, but I loved his pads with the Flames like goalie. I thought those were the best Flames goalie gear. But, yeah, I loved the, the dragons on kids' mask. I always thought yeah. that was the sweetest mask we've ever seen. I've got a, I've got a, so- I'm a little bit younger. I've got a soft spot for uh, the Kiprasov uh, 0304 yeah. gold uh, skulls. A lot of the flames masks have been rather yeah, non that, that, I mean, That's just that's and just borderline ugly. Yeah, that story, one was right? good. Like they're, yeah, yeah. and it, Terrific, no he had his Iron Maiden, Maiden guys. guys really like, really else else everywhere else, just in our colors. Yeah, like even uh, Vernon on his second. Well, I think go a lot around, of it is people just use images of fire. Too bad of a mask, but you know they they all kind of stink. <laughs> Though there have been, if you're looking at guys who just kind of use the fire image, going way back, Rick Tavaracci did it. Not too bad. Honestly, maybe the most underrated Flames organizational mask is, uh, might be Justin Pogge when he first when he came to the Hitmen. He had this cool half and half, like half of it was on fire, half of it was, I think it was some gangster in a suit, like some well a Hitman, mobster type guy, and it was all reflecty and whatnot. It, it uh, was a, for me, you that was an work. impressive mask. Not a lot. Of, no, nobody seems to have the balls to go split screen on a helmet. Um, and in, in, in as, as far as the as far as the league goes right now, who, who would you say the 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 best uh, the most quality uh, mask? Who has the most quality mask from year to year? Yeah. yeah. His well, November also uh, I thought Grace Golov's mask, Corey Perry the new one that he has, the Star Hitler, Wars mask, was uh, actually was pretty quite, decent as well. Quite special. A lot, I, I love that mask. A lot of the masks, not just though, right Corey now seem to be too... Just the entire team mustached. Like, instead of actual... sort of originality like, you don't usually classic, expect like, from the Swiss. You think of, like, Patrick Waugh in Montreal or Brodeur's. Oh, did you see... Did you see... Yeah... Van Beesbrook. Yeah, I was going like, to say the same thing. I think a lot of these classic masks, um, like all-time classics, are behind us because everyone's trying to get something to tell the story about their city or their upbringing, and it's really something that means something to them, but not something that everyone else can get behind. Like I remember uh, Hextall's mask and um, Potvin's mask. These, yeah, these really iconic masks that were they looked sweet and they didn't have a lot of meaning to them. They just looked fierce. You know what I think some of the problem is? Uh, it's that too many of the logos are crap. And I'd even throw ours into this because, I mean, you think of Henrik Carlson's mask when he first came to Calgary it looks like a street hockey mask. Like it's ju- it looks I think like part it's of something that depends on the artist, a, too. I mean, you know, a good artist can work with maybe not the logo, but the awful. symbolism and the flames and that sort of thing and make a cool mask because we've seen it done. Oh, yeah, no, no. But, I mean, like, you look at... Patrick was Canadian's mask. Felix Potvin's Toronto Maple Leafs. Like the even the Kirk McLean Vancouver. Mm-hmm. You know, the, there's there's a simplicity to the logo that allows it to be a nice, clean, just presentation. And and now everyone's got to have something going on. Like whether it's a cannon or a friggin' or sorry, a shark. You know, biting a hockey stick. It's like not none of it. Means anything. So you want to blow there's up no, the team, blow up the logo, change the jerseys, yeah, like said, no and meat. everything. And that, that being said, no, I do too. <laughs> I saw a uh, I saw a mock up on message board of uh, that. Oh god, they were just what about the life. logo? Uh, so yes, change the jerseys. 
three years out of the... Pl- you know, like, uh, am I the only guy in the city that likes yeah. the Black Sea? Yeah. Well, I actually I like the Heritage Classic I, jersey. If I, I you like it, but I like, I like the slightly black, different. I, I and like, like our less 2003, 2004. Yeah, you know, you could actually like and incorporated RPK black. Edge, yeah, like you, you change the yellow itself. to black. That like might when we look the sharp, triangle but it was yeah, like the, that, that was a, there's that was ways nice of doing it. It's just that you know the. RBK style jersey kind of sucks. <laughs> so it doesn't look like Ronald McDonald? I know. Like, you know, even if you just removed all the stripes on the side that are going up the jersey and just had it straight across, it'd look Uh, a lot better. Boston, to a certain extent, did. And yet, here we are, still stuck with those stupid stripes down the... Like, why are they necessary? Why can't they all just be the same color? Which stripes? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Call me a traditionalist, but I've always thought hockey jersey, the stripes need to go horizontal, not vertical. Yeah. I'm not not trying to... We know these guys wear 50 pounds of padding. We're not trying to make them look slim. (laughs) I hate the pants striping, too, on the current jerseys. It looks good on the red jerseys, but on the white ones, it just looks silly because it doesn't match up. But... Anyway, that's another story for another time. It's, it's, it's all a mess. Anything else anybody else wants to chat about this week? Now that we've got our gripes out and hopefully everyone's feeling better? I agree. I'm just going to have one throwaway comment that uh, Brian McGratton looked like an NHL player against Vancouver. And awesome. If he actually plays like that every night, there's no reason he shouldn't be in the lineup because he adds a certain element yeah. of... Uh, Psychotic. I, I was listening to who to, was it? Peter Marr during that game, who said that in one game, Brian McGratton is within one penalty minute of taking over the team lead in penalty minutes this year. The, <laughs> the team lead is 16 minutes, I believe, and he's at 15 already. I think it's Stajan. Who's who's got 16? Tangay could be. Oh, yep. oh, I think it's probably Tangay. He's always in the penalty box. You know, after, I'll just put in a throwaway comment too. After McGratton got uh, penalized for that salute, next time I see Yager salute, I'm going to be yelling at the refs to give him a penalty as well. Yeah, exactly. Oh, although it, it is, one, one more just comment about uh, that penalty minute stat. Every now and then, like, you notice when certain things just sort of. You you learn them like in one game. Brian McGratton is the most penal is nearly the most penalized player on our team. And you're like, oh, that might be why another reason why we are where we are. That's why we bring in McGratton Nobody's again. Scared of us at all? Yeah, we're like salmon. Yes, we're in the ocean, but come on. The flames just delicious. delicious. No one's got a problem with salmon. <laughs> exactly. Uh. There you go. That's how they should market this <laughs> team. If you're trying to trade a player acids. like Jerome McGinla, you can tell the other GMs that he's full of omega-3 fatty acids. We're just hungry. <laughs> by the way, folks, that's back-to-back weeks where we've closed out by referencing eating. I There's none to eat. talk about with the flames, so we moved to Cannibal Hour. <laughs> <laughs> we talked for 55 minutes. There's Lucas, any interesting about dreams about Drager this week? <laughs> what well, would you eat? A Ginlan is omega 3 fatty acids? Water to sunset. I cried. <laughs> no. Whatever works for yeah, the two of you. Tange. <laughs> yeah, we still have no insider information, Matt. This guy's dating Drager in his dreams, and he's not feeding us any information from that little blackberry of his. He likes he likes blackberry flavored chocolates on his pillow. <laughs> That's not the kind of information we wanted. There's your insider information. 
Oh, also, he uses just for men <laughs> along, along the side of his hair. He, may, he thinks it makes him look older and wiser? I'm good. <laughs> oh. No, 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 this is the cover-up stuff. Not Touch of Grey. Touch of Grey would be acceptable. He's... He's still, like, he's doing the Jerry Lewis where he's 80 years old, still got a full head of jet black hair. Very big in France, Drager. All right, well, that's more than I need to know about Drager. I don't know about you, Matt, but... Because I was trying to get insider information about the flames. Drager has that information. Well, you... There you go. <laughs> we got <laughs> inside information about Baron. Oh, my. <laughs> Too bad he doesn't have a number we can refer to him as. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, I guess now we know a little bit more about the man behind the hair. Yeah. I'll give you a number next week after I name a star All right. after Well, with that, I think it's about time for us to go. I was. I just want to remind everyone about the website. We have uh, firesidechat.ca where there's articles, uh, the podcast. Send your friends there. Send your family there. Anyone you think would enjoy the podcast. You could send someone you dislike send too if you think you it'd dislike. be a punishment to listen to us. Uh, follow us on Twitter. Find us on Facebook or Google Plus as well. That's it for us this week. We'll see you next week. Seriously, suck it, Tom. Fireside Chat Podcast, produced and edited by Dan Stevenson. Theme music, Take the Lead, by Kevin McLeod.